please a warm welcome for, for Eldar and Kai, and uh, remotely for, um, for Karsten. So. Welcome, gentlemen. Over to you. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, um, I hope you guys can hear me. Thank you for having us. Um, we'll present a few insights into the reference architecture aviation that we've been uh, drawing up with Lufthansa. Um, don't know if you know Lufthansa at all, or Capgemini, but I <laughs> assume you do. Um, Lufthansa. How much do we know about Lufthansa? Lufthansa is a group of company uh, quite diverse, um, and uh, as a group um, also contains not just Lufthansa, but Austrian, Swiss, Brussels, uh, German wings, and Euro wings. And that little uh, fact of having low costers and full service airlines is going to come uh, into the presentation a little bit later on. So in case you can't understand me, that's probably because I spent a little bit of time in, in, in Africa, a um, small place called Cape Town, and then moved across to um, a little island called um, Australia. Um, so not too far from here, um, small place, Melbourne. So if you don't get my accent, I do apologize. Just let me know, and I'll try to kind of come up with uh, the proper high English word for it. Anyway, shall we get into it? Um, who of you has ever been involved in drawing up a reference architecture? Oh, quite a few people. Cool. Um, that's a lot of a uh, lot of hands that went up. I might just see if we can. Then, because um, it is quite a quite a significant uh, undertaking uh, doing a reference architecture, and it's uh, especially in an industry that is uh, as diverse as an example as the aviation industry. Um, there's a whole heap of things that. Um, um, n need to be kind of considered. Um, so why would we do a reference architecture in, in aviation? Um, when I went back from, from the small island somewhere in the southern Pacific um, to a small place in, 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 in the center of kind of Europe uh, called Frankfurt, um, we had a, a significant challenge around uh, around skills and resources at Lufthansa. And, and Capgemini and Lufthansa have been partners for a long, long time. And Capgemini has supported the development of the architecture cap capability and management capability for uh, eons. So going back, a bit like what Chris was saying, there's a, there's a significant uh, uh, shortage of skills in the market. And um, Carsten and I, at some stage, um, sat down and said, how do we deal with this? We've got so many people here working on so many things, and um, we don't really find the right skills. Um, and at some stage, I just went to him. I think he's probably going to claim it was over a coffee. Um, I believe it was a beer or two, but I can't really remember. And I said, uh, let's just come up with a reference architecture as a tool to educate our architects coming from different industries and, and having to work on uh, significant projects within, um, within Lufthansa. So we did. Um, our challenges, uh, as I mentioned, that we had, and um, Chris also mentioned it, um, it is um, probably stand a bit like what everyone here would have um, um, would have experienced it. It is plenty of politics. Every large organization suffers from politics and the alignment to strategy. Um, we've heard also Chris early on talking about how do I provide the right value at the right time uh, to my customers and back into the organization. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have uh, we didn't have enough people and not enough people with the right skills, and we thought our reference architecture would be one building block to help us out. Um, drive those adoption of skills. Um, and obviously, the aviation IT knowledge is um, uh, quite scarce nowadays. Ten years ago, um, a lot of uh, aviation IT professionals obviously left the industry because of uh, circumstances and, and um, the, the global downturn. Um, and obviously, bringing them back online is quite, uh, 
quite a challenge. Um, we had a, another challenge around the content that we saw within, uh, within the aviation industry, um, managing um, knowledge, managing the artifacts are not really that simple. So we figured, why not put another reference architecture on top and, and make it really unmanageable? Um, and then the standard challenge, right? Budget, who's got the cash to fund this work? Because it's obviously not simple and takes a bit of time. Um, and um, so this, this kind of the, the four major challenges, I'm, I'm sure everyone who's worked in this space would have probably come up against similar challenges. Um, so we, we figured, as I said, you know, a beer or coffee later, we've got um, these, these challenges sorted out. So we had um, kind of intricate domains um, across um, the whole group of Lufthansa. We had uh, um, varying management support, mainly none initially. Um, we had a, a global group of companies, um, plenty of corporate politics, and, uh, and about 14 architects and about 28 opinions on how to go about doing it. Um, so we said, it's a great idea, right? You can't have better, um, kind of a better starting position than this. Um, so we called Chris and said, Chris, you're part of the open group. You've done this before. Can you come and help us set this up? Chris came in. We had a, a brilliant discussion about it and said, from now on, we're going to drive that five-star aviation reference architecture. Five stars because of what? Anyone an idea? Full service airline, we had a long discussion forever and a day whether we should do a reference architecture for the new airlines, the low cost airlines, a completely different uh, business strategy, segmentation, business focus, priorities, design principles, all of it, versus the traditional um, uh, full carrier architecture that kind of the, you'd associate with, uh, with the Lufthansa group. So he said, all right, let's do the five-star aviation reference architecture. Um, oh. oh, OK. Oh, keep going with this. So we had a team, and, and uh, Ella is going to kind of introduce the, the most important uh, architects quickly to you. OK. <clears throat> um, on this slide, we, we see our crew. Um, of architects and, um, or, and um, also people from the Lufthansa group. Also architects, the three main person are uh, Kai, Carsten Breithaupt, as already mentioned, and me as a lead architect of this project. And we have um, other architects that are responsible for modeling each domain, which is part of our reference architecture. Um, yes, <clears throat> this uh, crew uh, might grow or, um, or can be, be the same as now. It's 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 an agile, um, it's an agile team. Um, on the next slide. So maybe just one last item on this. We we sat down and we figured, what's the point of of driving a reference architecture that only two three kind of outstanding architects worldwide will be able to draw up and then communicate. Um, we've got a skills and resource shortage to deal with, so let's just put it on kind of as many shoulders as we can, right? Of course, you're going to lose one or two people uh, going in and, and uh, coming into the project or, or, or leaving the project, so there's a little bit of movement all the time, but we started with a, with a group of 14 architects, just, just assembling the 14 architects um, here was um, um, a tiny little bit of a, of a challenge, um, but it was important for us to kind of spread the word and the workload. Um, the base that we had to deal with, um, just as a, and again, people that have uh, done this before, um, they probably just nod in, in anger here. Uh, documentation, we had a plethora of documents sitting everywhere, um, artifacts, um, kind of project deliverables, different, uh, different cycles, 
Um, and at that stage, um, Lufthansa was going through uh, a major transformation, three major programs, um, roughly spending about $250 million um, to kind of uh, earn the fifth star the, 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 um, uh, for, for customer, um, 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 what's it called, um, experience, for customer experience, and uh, um, a, a massive BI implementation on kind of focusing more on, on um, the operations, and then obviously a revenue management uh, project that we also dealt with. Um, we had tested knowledge to spot everywhere. Um, we invited kind of uh, two or three people to come in and talk to us about uh, the business domains and uh, experts that would come and sit us, and they normally brought along another uh, five or ten people to, uh, to just have a discussion. Uh, access to, to material um, was pretty limited um, because no one was willing to kind of give up their, um, their smarts or, or, or their gems um, for us to be able to, uh, to then uh, put it into, into the uh, reference architecture. And we had standards. Um, I mean, the standard was that we had plenty of standards, right? You know how it, how it goes. There was not a standard that we didn't have. Um, so we figured um, we needed some sort of an intuitive framework and, and um, uh, some models to be able to drive this in a consistent fashion. Um, and our budget, plenty of discussions, um, plenty of um, ways of working it. Um, so the big question was always, you know, who pays for what and when? And then uh, who gets the benefit? And as per normal, anytime we talked about benefits, here benefits for you to claim, we had queues at the, the office buildings uh, for everyone to put their hands up and say, I want to share of this. But when it came to, you know, can you put some dollars on the table for us? You know, there was like no one there. Um, so we kind of came, uh, came to, to an arrangement um, that we kind of steal, borrow, and beg in that order not the bag, borrow, and steal, right? um, just to be able to, to de uh, develop the, the reference architecture. Um, so that's the context. Um, and um, a couple of significant items that we wanted to kind of maybe present to you that we found quite interesting and, and quite helpful. Um, four significant um, areas that we dealt with. One was obviously um, defining the benefits of our reference architectures. Chris touched on, on a whole heap of points, and they all true, um, but they look different when you're kind of in the trenches of, of uh, driving all of this. Um, there's um, the purpose and the framework that we, we, we had to kind of determine and, and work out. We had the had to agree on the modeling notation and domains. And remember, we had experts sitting there expecting a whole heap of um, kind of wise stone stuff, while we had um, 14 architects having 28 plus opinions, all of, uh, all of whom said, we have a better framework and, and a better way of doing this. And then as, as a last item, it's kind of like what happened then. We finished um, the initial iteration of, of um, the reference architecture as a, as a starting point, and um, a little bit later on, I'll, I'll take you through what where we at, what we're up to now, and, and um, where we're going with all of this. So the ben benefits um, it took us um, quite a, quite a long time um, to kind of digest the coffee that we had, and said we had a great idea, but. Um, it's a bit different when you have to go up to the exec and say, guys, can you, you know, work out how much this is going to cost and, and help us fund it? So we needed to put tangible benefits on the table and not just some, some wild and weird stuff. Um, and we said we needed to commit to, uh, to um, a number of things that, that could actually be measured. So one of, uh, one of the things that we um, looked for was um, hard facts, and we found out that time to market is the thing that was um, driving a lot of the stuff that was going on. So, um, for 
For us at that stage, we didn't have enough architects, enough IT skilled people, enough managers that would understand their, their domains and the interaction, the um, interoperability. Um, so we needed to kind of educate our suppliers and um, the partners with their people coming into the projects or being able to help us run the various environments and platforms. And that worked. Um, also, we saw this as a, as a means for higher productivity. Um, we've seen, I think, about three quarters are um, uh, TORGAF certified here. Um, once you have the basic background of, of um, the framework and you see the reference architecture, it's so much easier uh, getting things done uh, because you share the language, you share the, um, the objectives, and you know how to kind of be productive and, and provide value straight away. Um, and then obviously um, we're looking to kind of, in a management view, describe the capabilities um, that we saw that were important for Lufthansa at that stage, but also for the future. And there's a small thing that's, um, that's cropped up in the last couple of years or something. It's called di 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 digital something. I don't know. So, um, in, that, in that sense, there's, there's a whole heap of value being able um, to be unlocked if you know your position and if you know how to um, kind of grow, um, merge, acquire, um, or just bring in new skills and capabilities for, for your customers. Um, and again, that digital reference is going to, we're, we're going to show you a little bit more later on. But that was quite handy coming in as well. Cool. So um, after kind of knowing what the benefits were, we looked at the purpose for it and said, all right, how do we kind of bring in the fundamental purpose that we can communicate for this reference architecture. And it was, it was driving the common understanding. Um, Chris referred to it. Everyone else I've, I've talked to about reference architecture, uh, architectures uh, refers to it. It is about understanding content and capabilities and then obviously having the, the ability to develop that further. Um, it is sharing that, that language and having uh, an architecture community, be it within or with an extended architecture community that is able to understand what you're talking about with a defined set of, of um, terms and um, uh, words. Um, it's, it is about com being able to compare um, provider and, and solutions. I don't know how many RFPs I've done and how many, how many um, software selection tools I've, I've kind of gone through. Um, and every time you get some sort of, of um, submission, you wish people would share kind of the meaning and definitions of the words and it just doesn't happen. And it takes so much time to clarify, uh, to work out what it is and then to kind of align everyone. So just making sure that we could um, quickly find the right level of, of understanding on that was really, really important and be, be able to compare it. Um, and we had a, um, we looked at different levels of, of business domain expertise that we could describe. Um, so one was obviously architecture because um, that was the closest, um, but also looked at um, kind of procurement areas um, infrastructure uh, and the overall business management side of things. Um, just to make sure that we could kind of sell uh, the purpose and the benefits to the whole of the, the Lufthansa group. Um, and obviously the purpose was for us to be able to take this and then um, speed up um, the development and the definition across the $250 million at, uh, euros. Oh, it's just about the same. So um, to then being spent wisely and helping us reduce our workload because we didn't have enough kind of architects and IT people that uh, knew what they were doing. So how did we do that? Elder. Okay. Um, which button I have to press to go forward this one? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Here we see the procedure how we um, constructed our reference architecture. At first we selected the industry standard and in a, um, a second step we defined the domains and um, after having defined the, all the domains, aviation domains, um, we developed all architectures for each domain by each member of, of our crew uh, we have seen before. And then we published uh, the results and actually we have submitted also uh, this um, architecture definition document to the open group to get uh, standardized um, at the middle of this year, I think June, July approximately. Some um, publications uh, in the Axel Springer Verlag um, has been done as well about this topic and some um, journals in the German language. Um, yes, this, we, have, we have some preliminary results here. Um, no, ah, here. No. this was too fast. <clears throat> here we see our framework areas and at least 75 percent of, of you uh, should know these areas um, with regard to the statistics we have seen in the opening speech um, of uh, TOGAF certified people. We have here the four classical TOGAF layers, business architecture, application architecture, data and technology architecture. And then we have two um, <coughs> requirements for the overall architecture we are developing. Um, this is the consistency between these layers and the ability to easily and in, intuitively understand or comprehend this architecture. Because an aviation uh, architecture is not, uh, is not a simple architecture. There are many domains, we will see, as we will see later. Um, yes, here we see the continuum. Cool. So, well. Obviously, we're looking to kind of use what we knew about Lufthansa. Now, Lufthansa on the continuum would be closer to an organization-specific architecture. Um, but Lufthansa has a number of uh, customer and, and uh, company-specific um, uh, competitive processes that we didn't necessarily want to kind of present to the world. Um, so we took what was kind of generic um, plus the Lufthansa competitive advantages that we saw obviously had um, plenty of um, plenty of discussions and meetings to strip out kind of the, the essence of that uh, competitive advantage and then develop an industry specific um, reference architecture so we went kind of from the right hand side to hopped into industry specifics um, and at that stage made a lot of sense because we're dealing with the thing that we as the architects involved knew best and that was revenue management and revenue management is kind of about pricing and yield management and as you probably know Lufthansa is uh, currently I believe um, quite a profitable uh, airline unlike I don't know probably two-thirds of the airlines worldwide um, so in that sense they were quite keen to protect the way that they manage their revenue and, and manage the yield. Um, so that's why we went from um, kind of the organization specific uh, back to the industry, which is one of the reasons why we're here and not, not talking to kind of just Lufthansa guys. Yeah, cool. Here we see the notation we, <clears throat> we use for our architecture definition document. Um, here are shown the elements of the business architecture. We use symbols for the business domain, uh, which can be um, nested um, using subdomains. And within subdomains, we can also um, place business capabilities. We have also process elements, which we know from the business modeling notation, um, starting state and end state all this which we know already f f from the OMG. It's, it's not a new standard, it's, it's already standardized. Um, here we see 
a very simple representative model of a simple activity. Of course, the activities um, and processes in the aviation architecture are much more complex, but just to illustrate how it, <coughs> it is um, illustrated, uh, we see input artifacts um, into an activity, output artifacts, which are an outcome of an activity, and um, the, the complete chain of, of this process by connecting the activities to each other. Here we see some uh, notation, uh, or some symbols from the other layers, application architecture, data architecture, technology architecture. And an application is uh, given just by a simple square with a double-edged border and um, a technology component as well. So we, dif we differentiate um, easily components <coughs> from capabilities. Um, and uh, data elements are entities and information objects as we know them from the um, entity relationship diagrams. Very uh, standardized and simple um, method to illustrate relations between data and the hierarchy of data. Um, uh, yeah. oh, that's Here we see um, an exemplary entity relationship diagram. We have an information object and we have two nested um, entities with have an, uh, a, a relation between each other and um, also entities may be placed outside of information objects and we can connect them as we want using uh, one to one, one to n or n to m um, um, connections or relations. Here we see the domain model. Um, we have 40 we have 40 subdomains which are nested in uh, several domains such as cargo, uh, maintenance, product, network, fleet, uh, network and fleet planning, revenue management and pricing which is a very important and also amazing domain because in this domain a lot of knowledge is um, concentrated how to, um, how to determine the best price <laughs> for the customer and but also the, the best revenue for the for the company <clears throat> and in this domain um, Lufthansa unfortunately does not provide the um, insights how we can um, how we can calculate the price on which basis and how does it really work because it's intellectual property of course so, so in simple terms it, it's easier getting blood out of the stone <coughs> revenue management information out of Lufthansa as you can imagine. Um, but um, the revenue management being at the heart of the airline um, certainly helped us um, kind of um, get to a, a core, um, providing value back to, um, to all of the, the, the various business areas and domains. So that helped us, rather than picking up a kind of a cargo domain that would have been important for Lufthansa, but not necessarily at the, at the heart of um, the organization. So then we have marketing, customer care, we have flight operations, all activities that happen within the aircraft during a flight, and we have uh, supportive domains such IT services, finance, all those domains we um, we cannot um, we cannot assign to one of the business domains. They are located in the uh, supportive domains. Okay. Um, yes, we have 40 subdomains, <clears throat> and we could um, deep dive, uh, deep, also dive more deeper into each subdomain by uh, 40 additional boring slides. But alternatively, we can also connect to Carsten Breithaupt, our um, architect, lead architect from um, Lufthansa, which can uh, give us uh, some insights into each domain. If you have any question later. Um, Yes, for those who cannot read clearly what is written here, uh, might take the seat, <coughs> the remaining seats in the first row here. But uh, this slide is uh, just to give an impression of the size 
of our reference architecture and how it looks like when we take a look um, at all. We, we get, we get um, um, a view of the complete aviation architecture at a glance. So um, you will be able to read this in, in the architecture definition document after this will get published by the open group. Um, yeah, what happened then? And Kai, you go more in the next steps. Cool. Yeah. So in essence, we've, we've come up with a whole heap of insights um, across a uh, five-star um, airline. Um, and um, we look back kind of now, um, probably been on the, uh, on the run for about two years now, um, different architects having set up a system that was able to uh, for us to, to take a tiny little component and then uh, expand on it. So we've got the people, the structure, the, uh, the notation, um, and what we wanted to achieve was to build the architecture community, um, to have the ability to bring people into the aviation industry and then obviously have them be productive and add value straight away. Um, And obviously, uh, as part of um, Capgemini being a, a massive supporter of the Open Group, and um, Lufthansa are also seeing value, lots and lots of value in, um, uh, within the Open Group, sharing this knowledge and um, the, the ideas behind it, the concepts, the way that we work, the best practices, methods. Um, we've uh, kind of decided that um, under the guidance of Chris, that we would uh, kick up uh, an, an industry vertical. Um, so this is also kind of in the, in the works right now, and we're looking at um, deciding and, and kind of firming up um, how we want to do this. Um, can't invite all of the um, airlines, because that'd be like, um, what's it, um, kind of um, parliament or, or you know, you, you never ever get any work done anymore. Um, so we'll need to kind of scale up, and it's a bit like Agile, you, you add a few people and you kind of uh, get going again. Um, and based, on, based on, on, on this, we've seen also something else come through. We've got a lot of architects now that are um, highly skilled and have the tools and the methods, the structure, the knowledge to kind of easily draw up reference architectures. Um, so they've done that in their spare time. And it's just absolutely amazing what people can do when they know how to do things and they just want to do it again and again. Um, so we've, we've developed, I think, uh, a, a pharma reference architecture. Um, what else is um, utilities, all kinds of different, different reference architectures that, that have come out or um, found an update. Um, but on top, I mean, that little word that I mentioned earlier, I think it's digital. Um, that pop back up. Um, so we've said um, there's a different it's evolution of, of, of architecture and it's called digital architecture. So we need to kind of honor this. It's not just an industry. Digital goes beyond. Um, and there's something else, and I've never really understood what it stands for, but it's IoT. You guys probably would know, right? So again, um, something different that goes um, beyond and is, is crossing. Um, the, the kind of information divide, um, something that is at the heart of, of the open group, kind of make it interoperable. Right? So we've looked at it and said, um, we're going to kind of um, not only do industry specific uh, reference architectures, but also um, digital, IoT, and others. Um, next one is probably artificial intelligence. Don't know how to do that, but we'll work it out. Cool. Um, we've talked about that, yeah. Um, do you want to keep going? Mm. It's all right. Yes, <clears throat> we constructed an architecture uh, community. We have. Uh, what? Keep going. Okay. Next one. Uh, here we see. Um, here we see some sample architectures that evolve. Um, after having finished our, our first draft of the aviation architecture, we have a um, large IoT reference architecture involving all 
uh, concepts, frameworks, and building blocks of the um, yeah, Internet of Things. And we have a digitalization reference architecture involving um, all uh, building blocks um, that cover the four digitalization steps, tag, sense, and connect, ingest, analyze, prepare, and utilize. And uh, this d digitalization reference architecture also comprises um, cognitive computing, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. Um, yes, and here we, here we are, um, finished with our presentation. And if you have questions, we can bring Carsten into, into play. Welcome, Carsten. We're, we're we're we have one you, minute. <laughs> we're sorry you can't be here uh, to join us, but thank you for, for joining here. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get some questions. So the, f the first one that we had was, do, did you uh, use anything from CESAR, the EU reference architecture for air traffic management? Um, if, I, if I did get the point right, correct, um, the question was about CESAR. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't use anything from that. Um, we are involved in that project and um, we know that they have created an um, extensive enterprise architecture, architecture framework um, but at the time we started with um, our um, architecture framework that Elder and I just presented uh, and we didn't use anything <laughs> of these are so. Okay. Thank you. So while, while we have you, uh, we'll take advantage of you, Kirsten, if our speakers don't mind. What is the biggest benefit for Lufthansa from this new reference architecture? And second part of the question, what benefit do you think other airlines or aviation companies will see? I think, well, at least we are convinced that um, one of the major benefits would be a, a common onboarding, a common understanding. Um, so. Um, we have created the, the enterprise architecture framework based on Toga for our company and um, one of the main things uh, experience we see is that architects within the community will understand it, each other and um, so and that was I think one of the main reasons we thought that maybe the reference architecture for the aviation industry would make sense the sense um, and that would to the fact that um, the architects within the aviation industry, maybe of all, um, would understand each other better in the future. At least that, that's our hope. And um, besides of that, it's not the architects, maybe over the architects. So we have, we will create with the architects and with our companies, with partners, and maybe even with, and maybe with software providers, a common understanding what are the components, the building blocks um, of the architecture that we would like to have. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, next question. Um, how important is achieving, it's related to that I guess, how important is achieving industry-wide adoption of the aviation reference architecture for Lufthansa and Capgemini? Uh, and uh, we've talked about the, sec the second part of the question has already been answered. So uh, how important is adoption uh, by the industry to Capgemini um, and to Lufthansa? I think, from my point of view, it's, it's really important since uh, to create it by your own would not make sense. So at, um, even if, I, if I'm not um, there with you in, in San Diego, I hope that um, somebody will follow us and will um, uh, be involved in the future in reference architecture so and find some adoption within the aviation industry with and airports and other partners. Okay, thank you. We're, you're starting to break up at this end, uh, Carsten, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll press on. Um, uh, how did insights from revenue management drive key performance indicators throughout BDAT domains, and did those KPIs help implementation and adoption? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think that the KPIs from revenue management have driven um, extensively the, the reference architecture um, KPIs from revenue management will drive our internal architecture and will drive the evolution of our IT landscape. But I don't see a direct influence of KPIs from, from reference management for the reference architecture. 
then, then if you look at the web architecture, you will find some building blocks, you will find um, um, let, you will find components, and, and I think that's more or less, a, let's say, natural structure. From my point of view, most do not influence by the APIs. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, uh, did, 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 uh, what are the common vocabulary standards used within your architecture? Common what? vocabulary standards. I mean, TOGAF being yep. one. So it's leave, right? Um, <coughs> Carsten, do you want to answer it? Um, yes, um, it's a bit hard to understand. So that's the um, reason why I've asked um, uh, what the content of the question is. Um, I assume that, um, yes, we have, we have used the, the vocabulary of both. Well, taking the systems architecture, and um, then we have, we have had to look into our internal glossaries and um, terms of um, IT terms, definitions, and um, with the help of the uh, Kai and Ella, we created, let's say, more or less a common vocabulary of, of that. Right. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, good question, I think. Uh, what questions can you answer now that you couldn't answer before the reference architecture? Um, from our point of view, I don't think that we could answer any additional questions since it's more or less based on uh, architecture, not the same, since it's a reference architecture, a generalized version, but um, with our internal architecture, we could answer exactly the questions we could answer with reference architecture now. So we have a view on the structure of the IT landscape, on the functional building blocks, we have a view on exactly what Ella just presented some minutes before. So um, that would help us, and more or less we thought it would be, as I mentioned before, helpful to spread this knowledge um, within the upgrade industry. So hopefully we could answer some questions in the future more. Understand, understand. Uh, lots of other questions that we, we don't have time for because we, we have to move on, but um, there, are, uh, there are a couple of questions about um, uh, Kai, I think specifically you referenced uh, reference architectures from other verticals. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your work. Um, are they being published as standards or are they likely to be or were they already published when you saw them? Um, just a quick answer to that. Um, we've used what we what we could find kind of um, as a best practice. Um, so we've looked for, I think we've used the, the mining reference architecture quite heavily um, just to understand how do you go about doing it. Um, and then um, obviously we've based on the aviation reference architecture, we're driving a number of other uh, industry architectures. Um, but they, um, well, in the process of being um, kind of standardized or published. Um, so, and that's an ongoing effort um, across the board. So, right. uh, yes and yes, simple okay. answer. And really the last one, because I promised the people with connectivity issues that I'd uh, do their question. In a global marketplace, why would we not publicly openly share our taxonomies, ontologies, uh, recognizing that data is not, um, data, that's the trouble with writing, isn't it? Data is not the IS, uh, but the machines processing or using the data. Recognizing that data is not the IT, IP. IP. Ah. Okay. Recognizing that data is not the IP, but the machines processing or using the data. So, why wouldn't we share uh, openly taxonomies and ontologies in today's world, global marketplace? Uh, well, simple answer from, from my point of view, because I think we've got too many people that are scared. They want to hang on and monopolize um, the, the, the knowledge and power, thinking that they can kind of. Uh, freeze the moment and, and kind of be more successful or, or better equipped. Um, when you let go and you kind of strive to uh, do things better every day, then um, you come to the conclusion just mentioned um, that it's about um, the insights and the processes and the machines, not about the data. 
Okay. From my point of view, <clears throat> why we make um, architectures open, we can see in the IoT area, um, there are some um, projects, they, they think, okay, we keep our devices close, we um, keep the protocols proprietary, and um, the other um, the part, of the IoT world says, we make everything open, we make it a standard, and we make things to speak and to communicate openly together, each um, with each other. And today we see that the open, the standards which are open, they are simply winning and uh, they are simply used and no one is uh, buying or uh, developing or using a proprietary standard for uh, for his future business in the company. So, in in somehow, I think um, openness wins in in this case. Great words to end on. Thank you, uh, thank you both very much. And Carsten, if you're there, thank you too. But uh, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.